Hello, hoping all is well with you today. Welcome to our webinar, Incorporating DEI Externally Through Programs and Community Engagement with Donna Walker King. My name is Joy Young. I'm Vice President of Programs at South Arts. I'm so glad you are here with us today. South Arts is your regional arts organization serving nine states here in our Southern region. Our mission is advancing Southern vitality through the arts. Today's webinar is a demonstration of our commitment to our community. And our community consists of our artists and you as arts leaders. We do our work primarily in four ways through grants and fellowships. We work in partnership with our state arts agencies. We deliver programs in a diversity of arts um, disciplines and arts mediums. And we provide conferences and convenings like today's. So we have a commitment to diversity and that commitment to diversity is seen here. Our equity statement speaks to how we see our region being enlivened, if you will, through diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Today's webinar, again, is a demonstration of that commitment. And so without further ado, let me introduce our speaker, Donna walker Kuhn. You can read all about her bio. There's no reason for me to um, go on and on about how wonderful she is or the years of experience she brings to this work or just what a fabulous person she is. Donna, welcome and thank you again for joining us in this second webinar of our series. Thank you, Joy. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, I love being with my colleagues as we dive in together to improve the quality of our work and the people and the results of the people that we work with. So um, I just want to give a little background about myself. Um, I know for today, you know, this is the second of our two part uh, presentation. So welcome back to those of you who attended the first webinar and welcome to our new cohorts who may not have been with us before and are interested in this topic. But I also want to thank South Arts for their commitment to educate, share, and engrave equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility in their work and in their service to the constituents. And so some of the topics that uh, I read in your, your surveys is that you're interested in talking about, you know, advocacy for change, uh, looking at policies and systems to benefit marginalized people, audience development, of course, um, board uh, diversity, conflict resolution, fundraising, engagement. So we can't cover all of those topics in our 90 minutes, but, you know, we'll be able to talk, discuss some of them. Um, but so before I continue, I wanted to also just do a land acknowledgement, which is uh, my way of uh, providing equity and inclusion to um, the Native community whose land upon which I live. And so I live in Brooklyn. So we gather today from many locations, but for those of us physically in Brooklyn, and there may be a few, I don't know, we acknowledge that we are in the traditional territory of the Leni Lenape, the indigenous people of this land. And we honor the Lenape tribal communities that still remain in their homeland and those of the diaspora that were forced to migrate away. We respectfully acknowledge that from ancient times, the Lenape have lived in relationship with these lands and waters, and we pause to show our respect for their ancestors who lived there before, the Lenape people today, and their generations to come. Uh, and so I am an African-American woman. Uh, my lineage is from the, the um, Mende people living in Sierra Leone and the Mandinka people living in Senegal. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a daughter, sister, mother, fourth generation post-slavery. My parents were part of the Great Migration in the 1950s from the South to the North, and I grew up on the South Side of Chicago in a very tightly knit African-American community. I was exposed to ballet at a very early age, which framed my passion 
love and commitment to the arts. And I'm fortunate to be able to marry my passion for the arts with today's need to examine, change, and transform our cultural community by becoming anti-racist in our work. So I'm delighted to be with you uh, this afternoon and hope that you will receive a nugget of information that you can apply immediately uh, to your work. So my career has evolved from being a dancer, a lawyer, audience development pioneer, community engagement specialist, social justice and diversity consultant. I wrote my first book, Invitation to the Party, which highlights audience development strategies. And I just completed my second book called Champions for the Arts, which will be published uh, in January. So I am here as an advocate for dismantling racism in the arts. And I know that we you know we face many challenges, um, but today what I'd like us to do is to examine some of our perceptions, probe some of our fears, and think about how do we engage with our art and our communities. So what do I think we need at this time? I think that you know our work is centered around engaging our audiences, our communities, our applicants, you know, all of the people that we serve. And so we want to look at what are some sustainable strategies that are consistent um, that we can execute and start to really see um, a difference in how we do our work. Um, so I think what I live by is being able to interrupt, you know, white fragility, build capacity to sustain cross-racial honesty um, by being willing to do experience the discomfort uh, that's associated with an honest appraisal and discussion of internalized superiority and racial privilege. So this is not about feeling guilty. This is about understanding responsibility and our role uh, to be able to transform our environments. So let's get started. Um, our agenda today, I'm going to really focus on three key points. Um, one, how programming impacts community building and audience development. And then the second point, strategies for embedding diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility as components of audience development and community engagement. And the third uh, area that we'll look into are the 10 tools for building audiences. So I'd like to hear from you. What is audience development? Before I tell you what it is, I want to hear what do you think it is? Let's put it in the chat. What's audience development? What do you think that is? Well, there's 129 of you. I'm looking for some comments. Oh, there we go. Expanding the reach, yeah. Getting people into the seats, yeah. Relationship building, yeah relationships, people you engage, outreach strategies, identifying the needs of groups, reaching and serving all of our communities, stakeholder expansion, education of the art form, broadening, deepening, diversifying, teaching people to locate resources, curating relationships and programs that's relevant to the community. Those are all really great. Thank you. Very, very good. Okay, um, next slide. So what's community engagement? You told me what you think audience development is. Now I wanna hear what is community engagement? Please put your comments in the chat. Let's see. Asking feedback from your physical community, reaching out to constituents, see how we can serve them, building partnerships, two-way communication, Mm -hmm. connecting with the audience, including the community, working collaboratively, absolutely, active engagement, two-way mutually beneficial relationships between two communities, collaboration and connecting with various communities, partnerships, matching what you and your community needs and can offer. It's all really great. I'm going to share with you my definitions of both of these words. Um, so let's start with audience development because that's the older of the terms. So for many years, the terms audience development and community engagement have been used interchangeably, but they actually have different endeavors and they yield different results. The purpose of audience development is to create promotional opportunities to sell tickets to an arts or cultural event. The purpose of community engagement is to facilitate partnerships and expand access to the arts to engage in a collaborative process. 
of two distinct endeavors that yield different results. Next slide. On its development, the cultivation and growth of long-term relationships firmly rooted in a philosophical foundation that recognizes and embraces the distinctions of race, age, sexual orientation, physical ability, geography, and class. So embedded in the definition of audience development is diversity. Because the reason why we are pulling out specific communities is because they're not there. We don't see them. They're not part of this experience. They're not coming out. We're not engaging them. And so we have to cultivate that relationship. And when it's long-term, then we can build upon that. The reason I suggest that it's rooted in a philosophical foundation is because I think that there's a difference between performative and then actually doing this because you believe that this is going to really make a difference and that it is something that is important to do. And so when it's performative, it's simply being handed a memo that says, oh, we're going to be doing this event and we want to target the Asian American community. Can you find them? To me, that's performative. That's Let's just get this done so we can check it off our list. As opposed to, we recognize that there is a demographic that has not been participating in our work. We want to be thoughtful about how we engage them. So what is the philosophy that wraps around your actions? So audience development is also the process of engaging, educating, and motivating diverse communities to participate in a creative, entertaining experience as an important partner in the design and execution of the arts. So I believe audience development is not just limited to this transactional experience of you come, I'm telling you where to come, you come and experience this with me and we're good. Why not have audience development also explore what's the process of engagement? You know, how do we make sure that people want to be involved and that we're responding to their needs? So one of the um, audience development projects I've worked on a long time is with dance. And so uh, I'm a consultant with Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. And one of the cities that I work with is in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And so we created the Ailey Ambassadors as our audience development campaign. And what was really important was that the ambassadors designed the strategy of the campaign. So we didn't sit down in a room and come up with what we thought it should be and give them a memo and say, okay, this is it guys, let's go for it. No, we actually said, here's our goal. We're gonna be at the Fox Theater. We have four or five performances. We would like to engage as many of our audiences of color as possible. Who do you think is the best way to do that? I believe that that resonates much more deeply than commanding or dictating what audience development should look like. Next slide. So audience development is transactional. So that's the difference in the deliverables. At its core, it's an expansion of marketing that targets a specific audience for specific events in order to sell tickets or fill seats or to participate in something we want them to do. But it's a transactional relationship. And it, it requires that these people actually attend, that they participate. And it could be a free event, it could be a festival, or it can be purchasing a ticket for a show. But it's that transaction is where we, we look at success. So when we talk about the metrics of audience development, it's usually in the numbers. How many tickets did we sell? How many people came? Or will they, did they come back? Or how many other events did they go to see? Next slide. Community engagement. So community engagement evolved more in the 2000s in terms of the arts organizations, you know, and formalizing what this looks like. Uh, in 2014, I created the Community Engagement Department at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. At that time, we were the second art center to have a department exclusively focused on community engagement with a dedicated budget and staff. And so what that meant was that we had the opportunity to meet different constituents, leadership, stakeholders, and build a bridge to where they live. So community engagement is about access. So the process of promoting the arts is the center of daily life for everyone. But this creating access to the arts is what community engagement really focuses on, taking the arts to the community. Audience development, I'm expecting you to come to my event. 
I, you know, I put it out there. I'm targeting you. I've done my promotions. Now the result is that I see you coming in this transactional experience. With community engagement, I've done my research and I recognize that maybe you're having a hard time understanding what modern dance is. You know, maybe it's not really clear when we talk about this, this series of plays or this classical music, you know, concert that we want to present. We're going to bring it to you. We're going to bring it to you in your community. We're going to do samples or we're going to bring artists that look like you. And the measurement of success is that you came, that you participated and that you are engaged. That's community engagement. It is not an expectation that you then come back to where I work, to my venue, and then purchase a ticket. That then becomes audience development. Now, of course, there are many opportunities where these intersect, but the genesis of them I think is important because when I look at funding trends these days, it's really the interest of community engagement that most corporations are interested in. They wanna see their footprint in the community. So it's not enough to say, we have a new series running, you know, we're doing a whole series on multicultural, you know, events or an exhibition. That's great. But I'm finding that what funders are looking for, where are you taking the art? What are the footprints? Where is it going? And so that's why we kind of want to understand the difference. And then you decide what works for you. Next slide. I think the success of both is collaboration this internal and external collaboration. And that every department that you work with in your organization is a part of making this a success, that they're willing to invest time, labor, and resources, which means, you know, I may work in operations, but I'm part of this really large group that likes to go and have fun on Fridays. So I'll give you that information. I remember when I was working at the public theater and we were working on, um, uh, opportunity to engage the Haitian community, primarily from Brooklyn. And so we decided we were going to do an afternoon program featuring Haitian music. And we and one of the um, security guards came up to me. He said, Donna, you know, I'm Haitian, right? I said, no, I didn't know. That's great. He said, yeah, I'll bring all the people. I was like, whoa, wonderful. And so the, uh, the event started at three o'clock. So when they're waiting, you know, we're all excited and everything. Four o'clock, five o'clock. They got there at six, different understanding of time. So my three o'clock was for them very fluid. Yeah, we'll get there by six. So we had a couple of hundred people there, but it was just a different way of understanding what, what starting on time means and get there when you can. So I learned you know, how important the nuances are when we're cultivating different communities. That was hilarious, I must tell you. Okay, next slide. So we talk about strategies for embedding DEIA with audience development and community engagement. So these are some of the points that I think we want to look at and want to discuss. So discussions first with the programming on goals. Programming is everything. That's the centerpiece. You know, so we're here because we all love the arts. Um, but a lot of us are not necessarily programmers. We're in marketing or fundraising or management or finance, different areas. But essentially, programming drives, you know, the heart of our organizations. And so the question becomes, how does programming then serve these goals for audience development? How does programming serve the goal of community engagement? Well, it goes back to that spirit of collaboration. It goes back to the dialogue of understanding, okay, who is it that we wanna target? How best can we do this? And is this the roster of events that you've given me, will this enable me to, to succeed? Will this allow me to reach that goal? And to be honest, you know, in some organizations, it's there's two different conversations. You know, there may be programming and traditional programs and maybe a lot of Broadway shows and other kinds of events that appeal to a specific demographic. But when you look at how do I make this more diverse? How do I make sure that the people from a geographical area are feeling more inclined to come because we're representing them? Then that's where sometimes there's a disconnect with programming, which means that you have to be aggressive and you have to talk about, this is the demographic that I wanna reach. And this programming isn't necessarily giving me that opportunity. So how can programming provide content? So when I arrived at the public theater in um, 1993, um, George C. Wolf hired me to be the director of community affairs. 
My job description was to create an audience that looks like the subway stop. That was my job description. It's like, great. I know what that looks like. Then I looked at the plays. I was like, okay, um, I can see one demographic from the subway coming here, but not all the other people that I see with the, the, the roster of plays that we had at that time. And so my first uh, step was to go to George and say, okay, if I'm to engage the Latino community, if I'm gonna engage you know, Native American, uh, certainly African American, Asian American, I'm gonna need more than just this. I'm going to need programming that really speaks to these demographics. And so the response was, well, okay, but this is the season. It's already planned and programmed. I said, fine. I'll step outside of that. And so it depends on the structure. It depends on how much you are willing to expand you know, the programming. But what I did was I created a series of events that allowed me to reach these different communities you know, in a separate lane. And so we call this program Free at Three. So every month, the third Sunday of the month, I would give it to a different targeted community. And so I might give it to the Asian American Writers Workshop. Then the February would be the Native American, uh, American Indian Community House. Um, then, you know, March would be Harlem and some of the cultural groups there. And what did they do? They did whatever they wanted to. I gave them the space. I said, for two hours, you can play. You can have a reading, you can have a board meeting, you can have a yoga class. My point was I needed to engage this demographic and have them recognize this space was welcoming. They know how to get there. They know what the lobby looks like. They know what our staff looks like. And then we can begin to build further programming from there. But I, first I needed to get them in the space. And so we did that for a year. Then the second year I thought, well, maybe I can start to target this group, these, these different organizations to the plays that we're actually presenting because the second year we started to do more diverse programming. And so then I could say, okay, I've got my Latino group coming and we're doing Blade to the Heat, which is a play about a, a Latino uh, boxer. And so now my audience has a, a way, a thread between them coming for their event and what we have showing on the main stage. And then when I would welcome everyone from the stage, I would let them know, and we're doing a play, you know, that's based on a Latino culture and we have a special discount just for you today. And the box office is in this direction. As a matter of fact, right after we finish your event, I'll have a parade leading to the box office just to make sure you know where it is. So we started to connect the dots. And that's, that really made a difference and allowed us to go take a deep dive into audience development. And so that's an example of programming, providing content when you are able to create your own or when you can have conversations with those who do programming, asking them, can you start to shape this in a different way? Because this is a community that we wanna reach for these reasons, you know, really make your case. So creating programming that supports community engagement and audience development, that, that becomes you know, our, our goal and, our, and, and also our challenge. So what do you think are obstacles with this, with building programming that really supports either audience development or community engagement? Do you see, anticipate any goals or uh, any uh, challenges or have you experienced any obstacles? Anybody? Oh, I can't see you all. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Not having control of plays, yep. So maybe having stage readings outside your, your venue, identifying engaged partners. I'm gonna to get to that. So it's coming up in a few minutes. Rental facility, yes. So then you find another space. Everyone needs to agree on the demographic. Give them a reason why. That's why we do our research. Geography, barriers, absolutely. So in working at the public, I was responsible for all five boroughs. So I had to create pathways for people from the South Bronx who want to come down to lower Manhattan. People from Brooklyn who want to come to lower Manhattan. Why was that? Well, part of it was personal because building relationships with them and part of it was the content. What will be that experience? But it's one by one. None of, none of this is this huge movement that happens at one time. And so for, on our part, we have to be incredibly patient and build our capacity, you know, to really grow this. Yes, transportation, critical. And having something to offer communities that they need, which we find out uh, from doing our research. 
So yes, thank you. Those are some great goals. Well, I have a poll that I wanted to, to um, share with you and find out. Um, do we have that, the poll, or is that something I need to share? So the poll question is, you know, how many of you are doing, currently have programming that reflects audience development? Do, does, do any of you have that right now, currently? You're doing programming, and then you've got audience development as the focus. You have that, Jackie? That's great. Wow, quite a few of you have. Wonderful. Is it successful? What more do you want to do? What more? Where's the expansion? Where are the opportunities? I mean, you can raise your hand and speak, it's okay. <laughs> yes, Jackie. Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Is the challenge in audience development um, is mostly on our side of, um, of personnel to have enough soldiers to be effective. We, we don't have we don't have trouble getting one or two, but um, we. I did a project with ALE2 and we had a lecture demonstration in a church gymnasium and the uh, women's group affiliated with the church and the neighborhood coalition were the, um, were the partners. Mm. And we had 175 people come we were hoping for 80 wow. and we had to drag out some chairs. Where did Jackie go? Did she finish? Okay, but that sounded like a success story. That was great. Okay, um, so that's audience development. I have another question. So how many of you or uh, any of you feeling uh, successful with community engagement and programming? Carlton, tell us about it. Hi, yeah, I'm um, gonna, I've done this, I've done this before, but I wanna really take it to another level because there's so much emphasis being placed on this community engagement and um, also the, the issue about interaction mm -hmm. at various segments, should I say, uh, mm -hmm. throughout the, the, pro, the programming year. Uh, so I'm going to do a couple of productions and I want to involve uh, schools, parents, and students. Okay. And, and that's going to be, <clears throat> that's going to be <clears throat> pretty comprehensive because it's going to involve uh, several different ethnic groups. Oh, wow. So that's, that's what I'm, I've already worked with these entities separately and I mm -hmm. presented the idea to do something cohesive and um, we're going to move into the next conversational planning phase within the next two weeks. Oh, so I'm really excited about it. That's great. That's great. Congratulations. Okay. Um, let's continue with these slides, please. So I wanted to show you what we're doing at NJPAC with regard to community engagement. Um, so as I mentioned, we started in 2014 with the goal to engage new and culturally diverse audiences. And we were very focused in um, who we wanted to reach, multicultural, civic, professional, educational, faith-based organizations that had the potential to create deeper access and a creative use of NJPAC's resources. So, everyone that we reach out to has a membership, you know, that for us, that was really important, that there was a constituency that we could then be engaged with. And so our purpose was bringing the community together, encouraging everyone to take part um, in this movement for civil rights. And that's our social justice program that I'm describing now, our Standing in Solidarity series, which came out as an evolution of the murder of George Floyd. 
And so community engagement is a perfect position to respond to social justice issues. And I think, you know, this was an example of what we did and we built a whole series of panels and films uh, throughout the year, each month, looking at different topics. And so over the course of these six, seven years of community engagement, we basically produce 200 events per year. And we have attendance of around 20,000 people. And we have 120 engaged partners. And we have a newsletter that goes out before the pandemic. Our newsletter went out bi-monthly to over 5,000 people. Um, and so that was that's like the profile of our community engagement uh, effort. Uh, the photographs are from some of our events um, with the various individuals that we serve. Next slide. And so the institutional events, you know, community engagement is uh, internal, but also external. And so we talk about making the arts accessible to people. You know, we look at our Kwanzaa celebration, you know, how do we do that in a way that our community is completely involved? And this past year, it was all virtual. And we had, of course, our largest attendance, we had over 15,000 people watching our Kwanzaa celebration, which incorporated all seven principles, uh, included dance panel discussions. We had all of the sororities, fraternities of Divine Nine. We had our faith-based community. It was really extraordinary what we can do on this new stage, but how we also can continue to build community. So our tribute to the elders is a ceremony that we induct our elders because, you know, Newark, New Jersey is predominantly African-American and fortunately has tremendous respect for our elders. And so we salute them, we celebrate them um, by having this, this group that brings them together and then they are acknowledged for their contributions. Our Martin Luther King Awards reception is another opportunity to engage those constituents, that layer of leadership that we want to, you know, continue to expand our access. Our True Diversity Film Series, you know, we show these films in the community before the pandemic. We were in various communities in Newark on topics that were important to them, whether it was water shortage, it might have been um, discrimination um, based on lifestyle, LGBTQ. Um, we did rape on college campuses, you know, important issues. And these are all separate from the main stage programming of the art center, which is producing 500 events per year, booking Earth, Wind and Fire and, you know, Shaka Khan and all of the various popular artists that come to art center. So this is a whole nother lane that enables us to create access to the arts. Our Authors Expo was recognized that so many people were calling us and saying, I wrote a book, I wrote a book. Like, okay, we're gonna have an Authors Expo, which was a big room that we had that we rented in one of the communities. And we invited all the authors to come present what their book was about, sell their book. And then we added dance performances to that as well. Um, Ailey Dance, our wellness festival is a way that each Wednesday we actually feature a different dance workshop from different cultures. The month of uh, April was all Asian American dance, uh, uh, dance styles. And this month we're doing all Caribbean because June is Caribbean Heritage Month. Um, so those are some of the, uh, again, here's some of the facts of what we've accomplished during this time, really having a sustained relationship with our community. Next slide. And so in addition to the community engagement department, we have two bookends. One is our advisory council. Our advisory council is made up of these different subgroups, dance, our elders, faith-based, jazz, Latino, and LGBTQ. They were formed at the beginning of NJPAC to make sure that we always had our ear to what does our community really want to see? How can we be responsive to their concerns, their needs? I formed the dance committee when I got there in 2012 because the attendance for dance was so low. And I thought part of that is because our community needs to understand what is this dance form we're talking about. And so they provide opportunities to meet the dancers, to do some of the dance choreography in their neighborhood. So we're coming to your church and we're gonna do some African dance classes. We're coming to your community center, we're gonna do yoga. So I believe when people can get a taste, oh, it just diffuses the mystery. So that's been incredibly successful and it's one of our most funded projects is our dance in our community. Our elders, as I mentioned to you before, our elders committee said, you know, 
we've been around a long time and we see all these young people running around and they're just making crazy decisions. We want to have a platform to share our wisdom. So we said, fine, we'll call it Pearls of Wisdom. Pearls of Wisdom is this intergenerational dialogue based on parenting. We've talked about music. We've talked about abuse, things that they've experienced and how they were able to succeed in their lives. It's, it's such a rich, rich experience. Our faith-based advisory group said, you know what? You are not doing enough gospel music for us. We're going to do our own. I said, oh, okay, what will that look like? So they produce, literally, they produce three times a year their own events that brings in local gospel artists, local liturgical dance groups, panel discussions, women in the ministry, phenomenal. They even bring their own food. So this sense of ownership has come from the fact that we've empowered them to be able to define how do I have access to the arts? What does that look like in my community? With jazz, same thing. You know, when, when John Schreiber first came to NJ Pack in 2010, 2011, he started a big Moody Jazz Festival. But our attendance was really kind of modest. So when I got there, I said, well, you know what? I need to form a jazz advisory group that can help us figure out what's the best way to engage people with jazz. And the first thing they told me was, Donna, we like jazz in intimate settings. Yes, you can bring Diana Reeves to the 3000 seat house, but we like jazz jams too. Okay, so I found a place that we could have regular jazz jams. Clements Place is a beautiful lounge on the campus of Rutgers University. And each month, you cannot get into that room. We've had the fire department come twice with people just pushing their way in because what does it do? It features local jazz artists, three levels. You have aspiring jazz students, you have regular performers, and then you have the jazz aficionados all coming together. It's one of the most diverse events that we do. I absolutely love this. Again, a highly funded initiative. With our Latino community, we produce the Hispanic Youth Showcase, which highlights children in their performances displaying their culture. And we do that annually. With our LGBT community, they said, we want free form. We want to do, we want to do all kinds of different performances. So it's really like an America's Got Talent. And it is wild. It's just so great. It's, I can't describe the, the joy of empowering the community to define what is my arts experience going to look like. And then giving them the space to be able to do that, whether it's with where we are physically or in the community. You know, but uh, the goal is that everyone experiences the arts and feels that this is mine and I can really, you know, claim this. Next slide. So jazz, you know, again, wanting to be able to expand our footprint with jazz, I got a call from the head of the one remaining uh, synagogue in Newark, New Jersey. And so Ahava Shalom, they called and said, we want you to come and take a look at our space because we'd like to do something within JPAC. So we're like, okay, let's see what we can do. And we, what, so we're in our sixth year of programming of jazz with Ahava Shalom. As you can see from the picture down in the bottom, upstairs is a, a, their art museum. It's the Jewish Museum of New Jersey. Downstairs is where the synagogue is. So what we've done is we have built a program that has seven to eight different experiences with jazz. All of it is at Ahava Shalom. So upstairs, we might have a dance performance or panel discussion. Downstairs, we have the performances, as you can see. Uh, in the basement, we have the arts experience where we have one of our teaching artists that encourages people to make murals and to draw you know, their feelings about jazz. So incorporating all the various experiences of jazz, as you can see how diverse this audience is, is it's, it's unbelievable. Who from your team sits on the advisory council? All of the community engagement staff support the advisory council, all of us. So that we're constantly engaged with them. And it's a great question because this requires management. You know, it's not an email like, oh yeah, here, do this. No, we meet. So our advisory councils meet twice per year. All of those committees meet together so they can learn from each other and sometimes intersect. Then each committee meets at least twice on their own as they plan different events or produce different events. And so we have really made it our business 
to be available for them. Yes, all volunteer, happy volunteers too, happy volunteers, yes. And it's because they want to claim, you know, how do we experience the arts in our community? Next slide. Preludes. So this is an example of audience development. So sometimes in our performance, uh, performing arenas, we have space, we have a lobby space. So prior to the curtain, the eight o'clock show, we will invite a youth-based arts group to perform in the lobby. And we, of course, in order to be able to perform in the lobby, you have to sell a certain amount of tickets. And so this whole model was set up by the Elizabeth Morrill School. Well, first we just invited them to come and play a classical uh, music school that are excellent in their work. And we invited them, okay, come perform in the lobby. This is a great way for our audiences to, to you know, see what our youth are doing. And then they started saying, well, the parents want to come and the grandma and the aunts and the cousins. So we thought, oh, okay, then we'll set up a code so that you can start to sell these tickets. So three times a year, Elizabeth Morrill School will choose three of the various shows that we're presenting that they want to perform in the lobby. And they sell a minimum of 150 to 200 tickets for that, for that um, concert because their families want to see the, their children performing in the lobby, and then they want to come and see the show. So this has become an audience development initiative. We are targeting the specific demographic of students, and we can count on them. It's a long-term relationship. We've now have been doing this for at least six, seven years. We have monetized this relationship through the ticket sales. So the transaction is the success. So when we talk about preludes, we talk about how many tickets did we sell and what was the cash amount. And so this is just showing you what the differences are. Next slide. So now I'd like to just talk about um, the 10 tools to build audiences. Do you have any questions before we go into that? I don't see anything. Okay, so 10 tools to build diverse audiences is a strategy I developed uh, when I was working on Broadway. Oh, great. You Emily, you have a Jazz Advisory Council? That's great. Committee? Excellent. Um, so while I was working on Broadway, I was working on um, one of the shows, Bring in the Noise, Bring in the Funk, and was able to really bring in a significant African-American audience, young audience. And a lot of the producers started to ask me, how did you do this? And so I wrote a book. That's when I wrote Invitation to the Party, because I wanted to share this knowledge. So these tools provide a way to wrap around the strategy of audience development. The first tool is investment, like what you're doing today, taking out 90 minutes of your day to be able to go deeper and to understand how can I be more effective. It's also understanding that this is long-term labor intensive. There's nothing quick about audience development that I've experienced. Um, so the focus, of course, you're targeting a diverse group to become ticket buyers for an event. So you're investing in that. Uh, next slide. Commitment is the second tool. So I believe to be successful in audience development, you have to expand your life. So if you're trying to engage a demographic that you may or may not be familiar with, you have to go to where they are. And so that means maybe joining organizations, becoming more active in your neighborhood, serving on some committees. You know, well, all of these are ways to place yourself in the very environment that you want to cultivate. So when I started at the public, I, I had been working in Harlem all prior to that time at the Dam Theater of Harlem. So working now at the public theater in New York was lower in Manhattan in the village. So I didn't really know the neighborhood. So I just joined as many organizations as I could because they gave me the platform to be able to present what we're doing as a member, not as a guest, and to then deeply deepen my understanding of the community. Next slide. So research is the most important of the tools. You have to find out who are the people? How come they're not coming? And you can't assume that you know or understand. We have to do the research. So how do you do that? Many different ways. You can, of course, online, if you have a relationship with them and you have the email addresses, you could send out a survey. What I like to do is one-on-one, -on -one, face to face questions. So I can look at the whole body language. And often my company is asked to do uh, market research for organizations that want to expand their multicultural audience. And we usually do those in uh, focus groups, um, you know, really finding out what is it that, because it's a choice. There's a choice not to come. 
It's not like, oh, I missed it, I forgot. No, there's a choice. So your research will inform then what's next. What should my strategy be built around? Next slide. Review and analysis. Okay, so you've done your research. You know, you've, you've joined some organizations. What have you learned? Take stock. Figure out how can I do this based on my internal capacity? You may be a one person team. So how much can I do knowing I still got to make budget, I got to produce, I have to turn the lights on. So you have to really think about this in real time. Honestly, what can you accomplish? And from there, you start to build your success. Next step, follow up. So once you start meeting with various constituents and you talk about what programming opportunities there may be, deliver what you promise. Keep your word. This is essential, particularly for communities of color. We're so accustomed to having white organizations come in and make these promises. Oh, we're going to do this. Oh, you give us your list and we're going to do to produce this for you. So there's a lot of mistrust. So in order to really be effective, let your signature be Deliver what you promised. Yeah, I'm going with them because they said they were going to produce that show and they did. They said they were going to work with our church group and they did. So you make sure, I just can't emphasize that enough, how important it is to have honor and to be trustworthy in this work. That's right, Mary Jo, very important. Next slide, partnership. So this is my favorite. I love partnerships because we get to play. But the first rule of partnerships is that everyone is equal. Remember, this is not social work. So you're not lifting up a community. You're not fixing black pre people. You're not fixing the racial problem. Everyone is equal. You need this community. We need them. Because let's be honest, every cultural group has their own cultural experience. They have decided what things do they do that fill their soul. And so no one's going to die if they don't come to whatever it is you're asking them to do. But when you approach a partnership from a, a position of equity and inclusion, ah, limitless possibility. You collaborate with cultural and commercial enterprises that enhance both of you. I think sometimes we miss the civic component of partnerships and sometimes we're thinking just other cultural groups or educational groups, but your chamber of commerce, very important partner, your hospitals, your elected officials, all those are portals that lead to targeted demographics. And so you want to partner with them, meaning what can we do together that accomplishes our mutual goals? Next slide. So we want to educate your artists and audiences. So as I mentioned before, I think oftentimes people choose not to come to an event or participate in something you're producing because they just don't quite understand what it is. And rather than to appear to be ignorant, I just don't go. And so how do we then get in front of that? Demystify the art product, demystify that. So sometimes in our advertising, there's an assumption that the reader knows exactly what I'm talking about. All I have to do is put the name, the date, the ticket price, and then we're good. But how about going deeper into, well, what exactly is this that we're going to see? That does not mean dumbing down. That means that I've taken the time to be able to make sure you understand the nuances of what it is I'm talking about. And absolutely, Latanya, the welcoming, that is part of this, all of what we're talking about. It's making sure the space feels welcoming. When I started at the public theater, you know, I had walked by that building for years. I never went in because it's a big building. And I just thought, oh, I don't know anybody in there. And, you know, it just looks kind of off-putting. So I use myself as an example. What would it have taken for me to walk inside a smiling face? Someone standing there that looked like they were happy to work there. So when I first started working there with George, a number of the staff, the house staff, were kind of typical New Yorkers, all about me and you know whatever for you, meaning indifference. So when you're talking about audience development, you need to have your team that's on the same page with you. So rather than try to rehabilitate all of these house staff, we fired them and we hired people who wanted to be there, people who could own the art, people who were excited about that. The energy that happens when you walk into a space, someone looks at you and says, good evening, so happy that you're here. Let me help you to your seat. Or the bathrooms are this way. 
I can't tell you the difference that makes from someone who has not been there before. With someone, this is their first time. So these are the nuances that lead to success. Next slide. Building the bridge. And so again, how do we get there? What are the breadcrumbs that signal that you're safe and that you'll be welcome? Who's going to be there? How do I leave my house? What's the transportation you know, path? So all of these things you want to think about that suggest that it's safe, that I'll be welcome. What can you do? What groups can you put together? Can I eat first before I come? Where would I stop and get a drink? All of these steps make the experience you know, so much more enjoyable. Next slide, creating value. So one point that I've often heard is that, well, we're doing audience development because we give away a lot of tickets. That is not audience development. Let's be real clear. When we distribute complimentary tickets, that's because we want to have certain optics. We want the house to look full. We want to compliment the artist and make sure they don't feel like, oh, what a waste of my time. Fine, that's great, no problem. But let's not call it audience development. Why? There's no relationship. There's no loyalty. They don't even know who gave them the ticket because they passed it. My friend gave it to me and told me to come because she didn't, she wasn't feeling well. You know, it's just a whole different kind of experience. So if you're going to give comp tickets, and many of us are in you know, have the opportunity to do that, do it with purpose. That means choose an organization, choose cultural groups that you're giving the tickets to and let them know this is a privilege that we're able to give you these comp tickets. And in return, we ask for the email addresses of all the people that you give the tickets to. We ask that you share and post on social media. And we ask that you try to bring a group to the next event. That's how we create value from comp tickets. I think we've done a disservice just distributing these free experiences without establishing the value of the art. Artists have to pay bills too. So, you know, that's just something that I think we have to really think about more, more deeply. Next slide. And then, of course, appreciation. Always, always, whether it's community engagement with our volunteers, audience development with our organizations responding to us, remember to say thank you. So you're like, well, of course I say thank you. No, I mean, be intentional about saying thank you, which could be a lunch that you have for them. It might mean it's inviting them to a special event that maybe you use for your donors only, but definitely want to demonstrate appreciation. Um, John, you want to know, can you create value by inviting young people? Absolutely, to the community, yes. But again, one of the issues that I find with, with young uh, audiences and students is that we've created this expectation that you can get a complimentary ticket because you're a student. But then if you look at their shoes, the sneakers that they have on, I have a teenager, I know how much they cost. You look at the little bag that they have, coach, you know, that's not, not a counterfeit. They have the real thing. So it's a question of value. And what I'm trying to do is have us enhance and increase the value of the art, you know, so that whatever we do, we want to make sure they understand this cost and that this is how you pay. So you pay with your time, your effort. So yes, reaching them through mentorship, that's great. But it's not, I just don't think it's enough to just throw it at them and say, oh yeah, you got this because you're a student. Or, you know, I feel sorry for you. No, the arts deserve more than that. So how do we improve our ability to explain the value of engaging support for public arts and help us grow? So um, I'm not sure if you're saying it's, uh, explain value to um, funders or to constituents. Do you want to elaborate on that? We could take the slide down for a moment. I can see who that is that asked the question. Oh, from funders and local governance. So again, find out what they want. Everybody wants something. So you want to find out what is the language that they're looking for. Are they looking to serve communities of color? Are they looking to serve youth? Are they looking to serve, uh, you know, what, whatever that is, you shape your ask around that. And then you demonstrate what your deliverable is that I have you know, these constituents, and this is the work that we're doing, and this is what it looked like, and what you feel is the impact that it's had on their lives, the positive impact that it's had on their lives. So that's one way um, that you can look at that. So now you're going to do some little work. We have a few minutes. I'd like to um, do some breakout groups. 
And we've been talking and talking. So we get to dream out loud for a few minutes. We're gonna take um, 15 minutes to dream out loud because arts administrators, we don't often have the opportunity to do that. Thomas, you've worked at the public. Yeah. Okay, so in dreaming out loud, this is uh, what I'd like us to do when we break out into groups. You're gonna discuss, you know, what kind of program that one of your arts organization has done or is currently doing that brings in community engagement or audience development or both? What's the impact of that? You know, maybe internally, externally. So I want you to think about what have you been doing that incorporates how we look at community engagement or how we look at audience development. And this is what the impact has been and it may be at this point, it's internally what discussions we've had, or we can talk about what the impact on the community has been. So next slide. Rules of engagement, just so you understand how we want to do this. So first, you know, just leave titles outside. We're all working the same arts organization. You're going to choose one organization. So you do that very quickly because you only have 15 minutes. Just choose one. Everyone is working for this one arts organization. We want to listen to each other. Please share as much as you can. Assume you have the budget you need. Don't worry about money. This is why it's called dreaming. So we don't have to worry about the budget for the purpose of this exercise. Um, but you know, you've got 15 minutes to kind of play around and think about how am I working with programming and community engagement? What does that look like? And then perhaps if we can have five of the groups to report so we can hear what, what you're thinking about. Welcome back, everyone. So before we get into some questions and answers, could we get uh, some uh, voices from each of you, find out what you talked about? What did you think? Yes, Danielle. Hi. No, you on mute, Mona. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so we just had a really awesome conversation. Um, so we used, we ended up, the reason I'm talking is we ended up using our organization as an example because we are brand new. Mm -hmm. um, so we are Charleston Playhouse. We are um, a brand new equity musical theater company in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about how exciting it is and how much of a responsibility we feel um, as a completely new theater company to implement all of these things um, and DEIA from the beginning, from the ground mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. um, it's very exciting for me as the executive artistic director and the founder of this company to um, have this responsibility. Uh, oh. And we, <laughs> it is a responsibility, but I am ready for it. Uh, and uh, there are some things that we have done uh, already that we were just talking about in our meeting um, that I'd love to share. And I know, I, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be like a fake organization. We weren't really sure. So we just kind of did what we thought, but well, every, yes. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, so one of the things that's very important um, to us and that we really wanted to um, make a statement was we hired on a diversity director as part of our um, executive team. Mm -hmm. um, she is purposefully based out of New York city um, she is, has, was actually the first, uh, Native American rock cat. Um, and she has 20 years in the industry, um, is very, very involved in, um, conversations like this in New York, um, with equity, very aware of everything that's going on all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, we are going to have her do so much for us in the way of, you know, combing through the scripts and making sure that all of the actors are safe and in a, in a safe environment and um, help and being behind the table in all of our casting, um, in all of our auditions and in pre-production meetings and, you know, basically making sure that we are all doing everything that we can to move forward in um, what the theater industry should have been doing a long time ago. Um, but we are excited to bring her on. Um, we think that's like, going to be a huge way to help, um, within community engagement as well. Um, we are going to be starting a YouTube channel, uh, where we're going to be posting very often, um, conversations with experts, um, things like this actually would be a great 
YouTube channel educational experience for our community. Um, you know, we really want to make sure that we are educating the community through community engagement um, and not just putting on a show because it's fun. That's not what we're doing. That's not, there's no point of doing that. Um, so yeah, we will be hosting talkbacks after each show, um, bringing in, um, you know, experts and talking to our actors and uh, creative team as well educating why we made conscious casting decisions, why we chose the production we did, um, you know, the history of, of all of these things and just making sure that it's purposeful. Everything that we're doing is purposeful um, for each community to be involved. Um, we have a lot of HBCUs here in South Carolina. Um, and yeah, and one of the things that I'm really excited to do and um, we're preparing to do is to show up um, to these colleges, specifically our executive team to show up and let them know what the opportunities that they have now. Um, hey, we are this new equity theater in Charleston. We cannot wait for you to come and audition mm -hmm. for us and be a part of it. Like we want to include you so badly um, and not just sending an email, you know, showing up and really sure. putting your, you know, showing them that it matters and that you actually care. Um, we yeah so that's kind of wow that's kind of the start <laughs> of everything congratulations how exciting i'd like to just add the note for the colleges because i do a lot of work with colleges and what i have found first i always go to the president of the college you know something i learned from george was to leap so i always start at the top yep. and then make sure they understand the whole breadth and vision so they basically can give the directive to the different departments please pay attention to her this is going to be an important conversation and so uh, nj pack and rutgers university uh, we intersect on nine different levels of how we work together from the ras you know we the resident assistants we have a tour for them at the beginning of the semester so that they can then explain to the students who are sitting around saying how bored they are yeah why don't you go to nj pack they have this show they have that show so we do a presentation to the ras then we work with the parents of the freshman student because again parents i was parent of a freshman student you want to know where's my kid, kid going you know after class what's what's around here so we do a nice presentation for the parents give them gift bags all kinds of information then of course we work with the law school because i present so many panel discussions i always like to have scholarly voices on the panel so the law school is a fantastic partner um, and so they're always giving me wonderful uh, panelists and and thought leaders and you know resources to help shape the thinking that we're doing. We work with the student councils. You know, we work with the various departments. So colleges, fantastic partners. As are hospitals, great partners. Hospitals, they have lobbies. It's visual arts, you can do lunchtime performances. You know, there's just so many opportunities when we talk about audience development. So think about if these spaces, how you can have a permanent space so that your organization has a, a table there, a kiosk, and maybe have a rotating video that goes every day so that you can really start to inform and educate uh, where you are. Wonderful. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome. Does anyone else want to um, share? We have a couple more minutes. Um, yeah, I could. Oh, yes, Carlton. You've got yeah, something yeah. coming up. Um, yeah. Um, we decided to take our several organizations and put it up underneath to collaborate and created a new name, which is Community Voices. And we, we're going to, we actually um, decided to host a venue um, that would incorporate, well, it's an art gallery. It's actually okay. a museum. And they have, um, it's functional inside and out. So there'll be uh, multi-disciplines of, of artistic uh, uh, venues, or I should say artists that we're gonna pay uh, from, of course, we're gonna have music, um, we have a sculpting group. Um, there's going to be somebody or a, like a little camera crew going around and filming and taking photographs of everything. Mm -hmm. We'll have a, an editing suite that, that um, can probably put together a pretty quick film and show it somewhere before everybody goes home. You know, set up, uh, uh, you know, video and a, and a very large screen for people to come. And within, or I, yeah, Within the, the four organizations, we, we all have a following. So we're gonna wind up with a very inclusive, multicultural group 
-hmm. okay? And we're gonna send this out uh, on social media and we're also gonna put and post everything. This is gonna be like a pilot. So we're gonna be posting everything on a regular basis. Hopefully we can have one of these venues maybe monthly or quarterly at least. Mm -hmm. And we'll be posting everything on Twitter, YouTube, yeah. Facebook, Instagram, da 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 da. And um, wow. the, the first one's gonna be free. So we can just get everybody there. Mm -hmm. And there's also gonna be uh, multi-ethnic food on top of that. I don't okay. think anybody's gonna wanna miss out on that. There's a lot of great uh, Caribbean food and quite a menu, Greek, you know, you name it, we got it. So wow. um, there we go. Love that. Arts, arts, and arts. That's so great. You know, food has always been one of the keys to my success. Has yeah. been um, always making sure I had food there because, quite frankly, I can't really guarantee that you're going to love everything you see. Well, we but can't can, about the culinary arts. Go ahead, sorry. But I can try to make sure your stomach feels satisfied. Right. So if that becomes the memory of your experience, that's fine. We're still in. We're still in. So I yeah. try to make sure this food, no matter what what I'm doing. Uh, and going to the restaurants, I ask them to donate the food uh, because they're, they're tastings and they can get new customers. You know, when, I, when we have the public, we were working on, um, oh, I forgot the name of the play, but I, Sylvia's restaurant, Sylvia's a very famous soul food restaurant in Harlem. And I was able to get them to make uh, spare rib dinners and sell them for $10 during the, the uh, intermission. And so people came for the $10 Sylvia's ribs and then saw the play, I'm fine with that. It's like, how do we get people in the door? I think we have to be extremely nimble. You know, not everybody wants to come through the front door. Some people like chimneys, cracks, windows, open all of that space up. I'm just speaking metaphorically, but you know, people have different ways of coming in. And so I love what you're talking about, Carlton, that's great. So we, um, just in wrapping up, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, really great to meet all of you. I know the South is cooking, fabulous. So I have uh, two other slides that I just wanted to show you um, briefly. And they're just reminders of our work. So one is to have a long-term perspective. You know, this work never stops. And to make sure that you're constantly engaging with your colleagues to talk about this and build the relationships, make sure you have your internal allies. So when you're looking for funding, you're looking for support, there are certain people you can go to, you know, they're going to go with you because you've taken the time to cultivate that relationship and also develop the work culture so that everyone is really looking at how they can support these goals. And then um, the next slide is no shortcuts. So there's no shortcuts, no silver bullets for making sure we have inclusive workspaces. Um, we can send powerful messages as allies and influence, you know, when we're doing the work. So it's, we're the ones on the front line. So we're the ones that are building these relationships, having these conversations uh, to make sure that the work continues. So I hope each of us feels a sense of responsibility and commitment. You took the time to be here. So clearly, I know this is important to you. So let's make sure that we make it happen. And in, in that vein, my favorite a quote from the poem from Amanda Gorman. She shared uh, the inauguration of President Biden. She's talked about the new dawn blooms as we free it for there's always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. So I believe, thank you, we can take the slides down. I believe we are all warriors for the arts and we can take the slide down, thank you. I believe that as warriors for the arts, you know, we decide, we determine how we will advance, you know, in this new era of, you know, this, the wonderful portal, this portal that we are now in, and now looking at things much more deeply through this lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, making sure our work, our art represents our communities, but that we ourselves are polishing our lives and we are doing the work ourselves personally. So I look forward to hearing about your continued successes and accomplishments. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank uh -huh. you. One last question. Uh, we got to have access to um, this seminar and the slides. And also everybody's asking about um, the previous, the previous workshop too. Yes. I believe Good. there was a note here that said that. Um, okay.
in the Hello. chat. Hello. So yes, please visit our website um, where we have a link to the previous video as well. There will be a survey that we would love to have you complete to give us feedback on this, this um, webinar and others that we can plan for you. Yeah. So thanks so much for joining us. And there's the link to the survey in the chat. Cool. Well, everyone, have a fantastic day. Thank you again. Day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.